Uh, let me start with a quote from Leonard Meyer. Expectation is always ahead of the music, creating a background of diffuse tension against which particular delays articulate the affective curve and create meaning. Uh, so I want to introduce the idea that this kind of prediction or expectation is really there all the time as we listen to music and that it does have an emotional effect. Um, let me talk a little bit about a music theoretic concept called tonality or key. Uh, one of the main conceptual categories in Western musical thought, the term tonality, often refers to the orientation of melodies and harmonies toward a referential or tonic pitch class. So simply, if you think about C major, it's oriented around C, and closely related tones, the fifth, for example, and the third in harmony. So the musical key establishes more probable tones, especially in chords, especially those that are likely to end phrases, uh, likely sequences of tones and chords, and there are asymmetries here, so that the leading tone is more often followed by the tonic than vice versa, or the two chord is more often followed by the five chord than the reverse. So when I started doing this work in the 70s, music synthesis was extremely difficult, but this illustrates the early task that Roger Shepard and I developed. Uh, you will hear a context that defines a key and then a single tone, which is a probe tone, and your job is to say how well it fits with the context. <clears throat> I've got it here. Let me start again. Okay, let me start again. So you give a numerical judgment. How well does that fit? Okay, so these are the data for a C major context. Here's the high rating for the C, the fifth, the third, the fourth, and the other scale tones, and finally the non-scale tones. And we did this for a variety of major and minor keys. And this is the pattern for the keys. Now, one of the things that came out of this was the question of whether we could predict key relationships. This is another thing that music theorists talk about. Uh, so, if you talk about the key of C, it has no sharps or flats. If you talk about the key of G major, it has one sharp. D has two sharps going around the circle in the other direction was is F major with one flat, B flat major with two flats, and so on. So we were interested in seeing whether we could predict these based on the probe tone ratings. And so on the left here, you have the probe tone ratings for two closely related keys, C major and a minor, and on the right, you have the two curves at probe tone ratings for C major and F sharp major, which are diametrically opposite on the circle of fifths. So we generated a matrix of all the correlations between all the key tonal profiles and put it into a multidimensional scaling program and recovered a torus. So a torus is defined mathematically as a circle crossed with another circle. And you can think of it as an open tube that you close and then wrap around, so like a donut. But it's easier to see the keys in this projection. And in fact, in the multidimensional scaling solution, we recovered the major key, key circle of fifths. And it wraps three times around the torus before coming back to itself. And same for the minor key. And they're lined up so that you can see the basic important relationships. Circle of fifths and the relationship between major and minor keys that are parallel in nature or relative in nature. So just this very simple procedure of having people judge which tones fit with the key defining context is sufficient to produce structure at a higher level. So uh, Eddie Kessler and I had the idea of we would uh, use this representation now to trace how people's sense of key changed over time. And it was kind of a laborious uh, experiment where we had various chord sequences and we'd probe after the first chord with all 12 and then after the second chord, first two chords with all 12 and so on. And anyway, you can see we can, we're able to 
trace. This is a, a modulation from C major to G major. And here's one that goes from C major, and you can see it flips around to the other side of the torus and ends in B flat major. <clears throat> So Mark Schmuckler and I had the idea, maybe we could reverse engineer this. So we could take music and map it onto the key representation. So the idea is, like, like this example, we took just the first to four tones of a Bach prelude, the first in C minor, and we counted up the durations of the notes, the simplest possible thing, and then we correlated with all the possible keys, and you can see there's a very good fit to the C minor profile. Good. Uh, we wanted to see how quickly it could find a key, and we compared it to an algorithm that Longwood Higgins had devised, where he put uh, representations of notes in these regions, and successively worked through the music until all but one region had been eliminated. And you can see uh, this is the number of steps it took us to find the keys of the fugue, fugue subjects. And we got, got it most of the time. And with his, it took longer and was much less able to identify the correct key without taking into account the hierarchical nature, that some tones are more important for establishing key than other tones are. Uh, I just thought I'd show you this. This is um, on the bottom here, we, uh, with Petri Toivianen, we um, made a computer model that was a neural network that was just trained on the tonal hierarchies. and knew nothing else about harmony, about chord order, anything. And on the top, it, we project some human data where they're listening to this, this Bach piece and judging, it, they're hearing the piece in one ear, and in the other ear, they have a continuous probe tone. So all the way through, say that first probe tone is an E. They move a slider to see how well it fits with the music at that moment. And then we project that on here. I'll stop in the interest of time, but you can see that without knowing anything other than the tonal hierarchies, the model is able pretty well to track what the humans are, are finding. Um, now, here, let's get back to some statistical notions. Um, in the 50s and 60s, people were interested in applying information theory to music, and in that spirit, Knopoff and Hutchinson counted up the number of times different notes are sounded in key, uh, different pieces of music. They transposed everything as though it all began on C. And here's the results. And you can hardly tell the difference. The dashed line here is the major key profile. So it's saying that, that what I thought was a basic, you know, cognitive related to music theory and harmony, it's directly represented in the distribution of tones in music. And uh, it was kind of a shock it, that this was so directly uh, evident in musical statistics. But people like Leonard Meyer had said, styles in music are basically complex of probability relationships in which the meaning of any term or series of terms depends on all its relationships with all other terms possible within the style. Musical styles are internalized probability systems. That they are is demonstrated by the rules of musical grammar and syntax found in textbooks on harmony, counterpoint, and theory in general. The rule given in such the rules given in such books are almost invariably stated in terms of probability. For example, we're told that in the tonal harmonic system of Western music, the tonic chord is most often followed by the dominant, and so on. And also, of course, psychological research had shown. Uh, that in learning, uh, there's a high degree of sensitivity to frequency information. That is, how often various stimuli are presented and how often they are paired with favorable responses. So this sensitivity enables the organism, 
human or animal, to classify stimuli and respond appropriately. All right. Um, just a little bit more nuance about how these probabilities play out in music. Uh, they're not the same as expectation. You've got this passive knowledge. This is according to Meyer, but you, there are other form, similar formulations. You have this passive knowledge you probably are not conscious of about these probability structures that apply to music. But you're listening to the music, and really you, you are not you don't evoke this knowledge unless there is some violation. This is Meyer's theory, that when you have a violation of your expectations, that's when you start contemplating the alternative. So it becomes active, and that creates tension. Um, I just want to show you this. If you look at, this is just one style of music we've looked at, but actually these transition matrices are very sparse. You probably are not aware of how sparse they are, how good your predictions are, in fact. And so maybe that gives you a source of pleasure. You say, oh, the melody went exactly where I thought it might go. OK, but here's the twist. And again, I'm going to draw on Leonard Meyer. It is a mistake to suppose that probability remains relatively constant throughout musical works. Quite the contrary. Some parts of a work tend to adhere much more closely to the normative and probable than do other parts. The serious statistical and methodological errors arise if probabilities are computed on the basis of a total average frequency over the entire piece. Uh, just jumping down to the, music is not a natural system. And this is the twist. It is man-made and man-controlled, and it is able to combat the tendency toward the tedium of maximum certainty through the design uncertainty introduced by the composer. And in fact, we've, we've done experiments where we measure musical tension and found that there is this kind of asymmetric tension curve that's quite prevalent. A section will be begin with low tension, neutral tempo, new musical ideas, and then progress to higher tension, slowing down the tempo, increasing the note density, and increased dynamics. And in fact, you can think about this as these t tension curves superimposed on other tension curves. Here are some actual examples. Uh, this is uh, from a Mozart uh, piano sonata. This is uh, from an experiment that I did um, with Fred Lerdahl. And um, I want to say that his model, the tonal pitch space model, he's here at Columbia. I don't especially want to emphasize it here, but I would bring it up anyway. Uh, his tension model is really the only quantitative model that can predict these hierarchical tension values. Um, you probably can't see very well, but he has uh, tree-like structures that are similar to language. And the more deeply embedded uh, an event is in this tree, the higher the tension. Let me just play you the notes that correspond to this part of the tension curve. Just maybe an interesting project would be to uh, look at the, say, the transition matrices during different parts of phrases. Okay, I just since uh, this is uh, related to this program is related to neuroscience, I wanted to mention a, a paper that came out recently, and uh, would be interested in your views about this. Um, this was a study that presented 165 natural sounds. Uh, these sounds had been crowdsourced for what some of the most typical sounds are. And uh, then what they did with MRI was play all of these sounds and record the voxel activations in this band here. Uh, so they're 165 sounds. And then they, that was their data matrix. And then they decomposed this and found that six components 
explain 80% of the variation. So then they went back and looked at which acoustic samples uh, belong to which component. So component one responded to relatively low pitches and not very much to high pitches. Component two seemed to respond to higher pitches and not lower pitches. Uh, component three seemed to respond to stimuli with rapid temporal transitions, but not to more steady state things. And component four seemed to be the opposite. And then you have components five and six, and it's not so clear from just looking at the acoustics uh, what they're responding to. But if you go back and look at the stimuli in terms of the degree to which they fit that component, um, the, uh, all the green uh, lines correspond to things that were actually language. There are a few things in here that are not language, but they're vocal music. Here, the blue ones are all music, but there are a few things in here that are not music, but they have music-like qualities, like wind chimes and ringtone and whistling. Then they were able to go back and determine uh, which areas of auditory cortex uh, were associated, and I'm showing you the ones that were associated with, with music. So I asked Josh, who was one of the authors, Josh McDermott, um, maybe it would be interesting to look and see which, what accounts for the variation in the activation. So he sent me the sounds. Here's something that was, this is the most uh, rated as the high, it had the highest activation. I'll do it again. And something a little bit less. These are very short snippets. So that's a non-musical one. It has sort of a musical quality to it. <laughs> OK, so I thought it'd be interesting to have people rate these uh, along some really basic dimensions. How melodic they are, how rhythmic they are, um, how strong the emotional reaction to them is, and how much it makes them feel like moving. And I put this into uh, components. And that, there really seem to be two orthogonal dimensions here, both of which contribute to the rank order. Uh, one is the melody, and that correlates uh, with the emotion. And the other is rhythmic, and that correlates with the uh, degree that the, uh, the music or the sound what makes you want to move. So I thought that was sort of interesting. And I went back to think about uh, an fMRI study that I did. I was interested in violations of expectations. And I had these nice short little melodies. <laughs> And then I introduced So that was a tonal violation. Or both. And there were 17 musically trained people. Uh, the behavioral results in the two tasks, they, in some parts of the experiment, they were asked to judge whether there was a tonal violation, other parts whether there was a rhythmic violation. And I, there were all kinds of different contrasts. But the one I wanted to show here, only this, is the tonal and rhythmic violations compared with no violations. Even when the subjects were just passively listening, they weren't performing any task. We found activation in the same general area, secondary auditory cortex, that this recent study has found. And this is crucial, I think, for my understanding this. There were no differences between the tonal violations and the rhythmic violations. And that was sort of problematic at the time, because repository was thinking about one hemisphere specializing in temporal discriminations, another uh, specializing in tonal uh, relationships. 
but if there are in fact these two components contributing to musicality, it makes more sense that violating, violating both the tonal and the rhythmic would produce these similar activations. Okay, thank you, I'll stop there. <laughs>